To Hell and Back Book 4 in the Mel Goes to Hell series Written by Demelza Carlton Autonarrated by A.I. Charlotte from Google 1. You're coming with me, Luce. We'll return to hell together. Luce watched the chainmail-clad girl clink off. Armor on a guy just looks old-fashioned, but on a woman, it made him feel a bit nostalgic. If Mel had fought in the heavenly battle all those centuries ago dressed in mail like that one, hell, he'd have fallen to his knees and begged to surrender to her. Maybe if he hinted to Mel, she'd consider. Just think, you'll get to wear pants again. Pants. Damn. That meant no fooling around. At least, not yet. Any chance you'll let me lose the pants later? He asked eagerly. Loose. Two. It looks just like we left it, Luce said, looking around as he headed for the bedroom. He stumbled over a shoe and kicked it away, swearing. Who left all these here, where I could trip over them? They're yours, Luce. You were wearing them when you kicked the juvenile swan and earned yourself a nasty nip, back at the office Christmas party, Mel replied, stepping daintily over the obstacles as she made her way to the kitchen. Would you like some tea? I find it always helps ground me when I've been without a body for a while. Sure, Luce said grinning. Boil the kettle. I've been thinking about your body all week, and I have some ideas I'd like to try out. He pulled out a dining chair and sat down patting his lap. We could get started while the water heats up. Maybe heat things up a little more. Mel laughed, crossing the kitchen to fill the kettle. She clicked it on, returned to Luce, and lowered herself onto his lap, crossing her wrists behind his neck. I have some ideas too, she murmured, drawing him in closer for a kiss. His hands caressed her back through the silk of her dress, and his arms tightened around her as she slipped her tongue between his lips. Mel could feel the love spilling out of his soul and hoped he could feel the same from hers. So many centuries of soul reading without revealing her presence, dot, but she was learning to let loose sense her. Her body betrayed her thoughts, making Luce break the kiss to whisper, You're too tense, Mel. Don't think about it. Only share what you want to. Your body is expressive enough for me to read plenty from you, without you needing to share your whole soul. Humans manage love like this just fine. He chuckled. Focus on my body for once and not my soul. I made sure it was perfect for you, Mel. I promise you'll enjoy it. He pressed his lips to the side of her neck, trailing kisses down to the neckline of her dress. Mel tipped her head back, closing her eyes as he kissed her breasts, or what little he could reach without her taking her clothes off. Luce, I'd like to. So would I, he said, returning to her lips. He deepened the kiss, tightening his hold on her as if he'd never, ever let her go. A new and distinctly annoyed voice rang out, killing the moment. Kissing demons is disgusting, Mel. I didn't believe you'd ever. If the lady will let me, I'll show you just how wrong you are, Luce offered instantly. No, Luce, that's not. Mel pulled away from him. Raphael, you should really knock first. You could have saved yourself from seeing things you don't like. You'd best remember to be polite to my guest too, Luce is an angel, the same as you. Definitely not a demon anymore. Fine. Former demon then. You look like you're about to sleep with him. Ex-demon or not, I wouldn't have thought you'd stoop so low as to. Lo is condemning an innocent man to hell, Raphael, Mel said coldly. What Luce and I do is really none of your business, nor your concern. Why are you here? If you've only come to lecture me on going to hell and bringing Luce home with me, you may leave. Gracefully, she rose from Luce's lap and headed for the kitchen, smoothing her dress down along the way. I came here to tell you about Percy and the mess she's left us in. It has nothing to do with him. Raphael glared at Luce. He's the one you should ask to leave. Mel spooned tea into her teapot. Luce is my guest and he's free to leave whenever he wishes, 
but he's here at my invitation now. My love, I think you should stay to hear what Raphael has to say. Why? Raphael spat. Mel poured a steady stream of hot water over the mixture of leaves and flowers. Because I need Luce to help me clean up Percy's mess. He's going to return to his old job as CEO of the Hell Corporation. What? The two men shouted together. Luce recovered first from his shock. Only if you're working there too. I'm not going back to hell without a small slice of heaven. You can have the office across from mine and I'll make you coffee every morning. Mel's smile lit up her whole face. That sounds lovely. Of course I will, Luce. 3. Mel carried her cup of tea to the armchair by the window, and settled into the well-padded cushions. Luce clunked his cup on the coffee table and sprawled across the sofa, leaving Raphael the other armchair. He watched in fascination as the archangel dragged one of the dining chairs over and parked his backside on that instead. He sat stiff and silent, making Luce wonder if he was going to say anything at all or if he was just wasting their time. Raphael, didn't you come here to tell me about Percy? Mel asked. I mean, do you know who the last person was to see her before she disappeared? Me, he said hoarsely, then cleared his throat. Me. I was the last one to see her. We were discussing the dismantling of the Demon Corporation, and their banishment back to hell. Persephone worried about sending anyone back, because that would only strengthen this guy's army. He shot loose a cold glare. He was pining for you, she said, but he'd soon realize you wouldn't have feelings for the likes of him and take up arms against heaven again. I told Persephone that she'd have some time, as the devil had managed to lure you into hell and under some sort of spell that made you forget who and what he is. Raphael's eyes glittered. She said. Hang on, Luce interrupted. You fed her a line of bullshit about how I've worked some sort of hocus-pocus on Mel? I thought angels couldn't lie. Raphael glared at him again. I don't know how you did it, but there's no way Mel would give you the time of day without some sort of magic. Persephone said she'd find you and make it right. But instead, she disappeared. He dropped his gaze to the floor. She was supposed to visit her mother in heaven after our meeting, but she never arrived. Demeter said Persephone would never have forgotten, she's very close to her mother. The same mother who tried to take a sword to me, Luce fumed. If he wasn't with you at the time Mel, I'd have suspected him, Raphael continued. After what he did to Percy last time. Luce jumped to his feet. I didn't touch the little bitch. She's feeding lies to the lot of you. Say it to my face, Angel. If you want to accuse me of crimes I didn't commit, we can take this all the way to Heaven's gates. Go on. He advanced on the wide-eyed Angel, or at least he tried to, but he couldn't seem to move. Raphael rose. Not so tough now, are you? He taunted, yet when he tried to step forward, it looked like he'd run into an invisible wall. Enough, Mel said softly, her eyes darting from Raphael to Luce and back again. The edge of steel in her tone made it an order neither of them could disobey. And neither of them could move. She was doing it. Luce realized a split second before Raphael did. Whatever you believe about Luce, you're mistaken, she said to Raphael. Do you know anything else about Percy? No, he said sullenly. So I should go. He attempted to, but Mel's invisible grip still held him fast. Luce grinned. Now who's tough? Mel placed her hand on his chest. Luce please. The more polite you both are, the more smoothly this will go, and the sooner it'll be over. Now I want both of you to sit down please. Luce finally capitulated, and a moment later, Raphael followed. Better, Mel said. So I gather that the problem is that Percy's missing and no one's in charge of hell. Yes? No, Luce replied. I think Lily and the other senior demons are in charge. 
The Hell Corporation could be run by a concussed monkey right now for all I know. I only signed over the company to the Nephilim girl. Mel inclined her head. Okay. So no one's in charge of the Hell Corporation and the best qualified person to replace her is the retired CEO, you, Luce. As we've already agreed, I'll assist. Raphael, if you find Percy or if someone else does, you already said she's looking for me, so I want to know if you hear anything about her. Raphael nodded, but the calculating look in his eyes showed that his mind was working overtime. I'll give you regular updates about anything we hear to do with Percy. I also want a team of angels to assist me in the office with some exushai, if George can spare any. Oh no, not bloody powers. Luce groaned. Last time I ran into one of them, he pulled out a damn sword and tried to butcher me in the middle of the street. The last thing I need in hell is a bunch of archaic warrior angels who think I have a target painted on my ass. Wearing pants might help fix that problem, Luce. Mel's eyes danced with laughter before she resumed in a more serious tone, Exushai are experts at dealing with demons, so I need some. I'm sorry. But Raphael can explain the terms, no drawing without provocation and they must stay away from you. I'll give you a list of who I want, Raphael. Raphael nodded again. Is that all? No, Mel said slowly. There's also the matter of the underwear you owe me. And a new shirt. Luce smirked at Raphael, only to find the angel wore a similar expression. So who owed her underwear then? Raphael, I was helping out the agency when my clothing was damaged. I require replacements, Mel explained. Luce sniggered. I'm not not shopping for women's clothes. Raphael spluttered, flushing. Mel shrugged. Fine. She held out her hand. Then give me your agency credit card, please. Raphael pulled out his wallet and handed over the card, glowering. He better not be helping you. A wicked smile spread across her face. That's none of your business, Raphael. Now if there's nothing else, keep me updated. I'll see you out. When the door closed behind Raphael, Luz said, I can help you. I know this shop that sells the sexiest. Luz. Though I don't do it often, I'm familiar with clothes shopping. I'm sure I'll be fine. Besides, I have to do something on my lunch break, and there are plenty of suitable stores in the city near the office. Mel's eyes met his. Now, what were we planning on doing before we were interrupted? Luce grinned. Let me refresh your memory. 4. Luce's heart sank as each step dragged him deeper inside the Hell Corporation building. Was it dread, sadness or something else that made him want to be anywhere but here? He couldn't decide. All he knew for sure was that there was no place for him in Hell or Hell anymore. He was a changed man, demon, no angel, happy to follow wherever his sweet angel led. Mel stepped into the darkened CEO's office first. She's not here and she hasn't been for a while. Luce edged in behind her and flicked the lights on. She was right of course, there was no sign of the half-angel here. Just thinking about her made him shiver, though he couldn't be sure if there was some sign of her presence or whether he was just imagining things. Oh she left the paintings. Mel cried, crossing the room to stand before the framed Proheart landscapes. I've wanted to take a closer look at these since the first time I visited your office. Luce racked his memory, trying to recall when she'd expressed her interest in his taste for Australian art. His heart sank when he realized that on that long ago day, he'd completely ignored her wish to know more about him, as he'd let his own carnal desire to possess her consume him. Oh hell, he'd been so cocksure she'd obey him, he'd unzipped his pants the moment he heard her voice. He'd never be able to make amends for that, but he'd go a long way to try. They're yours if you want them. I pick them not just for the colors, but for the life they represent. 
the friendly games of cricket on the beach, the rugby matches, the country towns with people and red dirt and gum trees, it's the idealised life Australians want to live, even when they can't. I wish I could show you the Rembrandts I used to have in my house in Amsterdam, full of angelic merchants, when the reality was that they were waging war on the native inhabitants of the countries they'd invaded and killing their own employees with disease and malnutrition to feed their own greed. So much easier to get them to sign their souls away, when they believed they were behaving more like angels than demons. He became conscious of her concerned eyes on him. You should have them. Every time I look at them now, I'll remember how I corrupted this or that politician, company director or angel in this office. Mel kissed his cheek. No, we'll leave temptation here, so I can see them every time I come visit you in your office. We can admire them together. His heart ached to do something else for her, something that would wipe away the painful memories of his first misguided advances. When she'd politely declined and walked out on him, leaving behind the intoxicating scent that drove him mad. A crazy, half-formed idea came to him, and he opened the cupboard before he could talk himself out of it. Everything was just as he'd left it, Persephone hadn't touched anything on this shelf. Luce grabbed the spray bottle and roll of paper towels, bumping the door shut with his elbow as he turned back to the desk. The bottle squeaked as he squirted cleaning fluid all over the desk surface, but he continued until he'd covered it completely. He set the bottle down and ripped off a length of toweling, swiping at the desk until it shone. Doubt seized him. She'd refuse him again, he was certain of it. Plus Persephone had used this desk in his absence, one wipe wasn't enough. He spritzed the surface again and repeated his furious circles with the paper towels. A second time, did it need a third? It had to be perfect for Mel, she deserved no less. Luce lifted the bottle again and pulled back the trigger. What are you doing? Luce wasn't sure how long Mel's eyes had been on him, but they held sadness. She was going to refuse. She was going to remember how horrible he'd been when she'd first started working here, change her mind and never come back. She'd Mel gently pulled the ammonia-drenched paper towels from his hand and dropped them in the waste paper basket under the desk. It's clean. You were very thorough. I'm sure you don't need to worry about working on a dirty desk, ever again. You can ask Mephi to send a reminder to the office cleaners first thing. No, Luce blurted out. I cleaned it for you. I want, I need you to lie down on the desk. She stepped back, out of his reach. Luce's heart died a little. Luce, for your own good, you know I have to say no to that. I know this office reminds you of what you were in the past, but you're a different man now, and you can't just give in to your desires and passions the way you used to. If you really feel you need me that badly, you can stay at my place tonight, and perhaps we can. Melody, please. I've changed, but I'm still the same man. One who regrets being so rude to you that first time you were here. When all I wanted was to possess your body and soul, neither of which I deserve. I need to expunge it from your memory and mine. This is different. This time, it's about you. I want to show you how much I treasure you and make amends for not considering your desires. I want you to, he swallowed, certain she was going to refuse his outrageous request, trying to find words that wouldn't sound as crass as the ones in his head, lie down on my desk and let me fall to my knees and worship you. He regretted his words as soon as they were out. Mel backed away, shaking her head, and his heart plummeted. No loose. Angels aren't to be worshipped. We're here to help, not pose as deities. Luce burst out laughing. You've got me tongue-tied so I can't say anything right. That's not what I meant. I'm trying to say I want to pleasure your body with mine here on the desk. My mouth, my hands, my everything focused purely on your pleasure. Part of my penance to you for being such a prick. She softened and stepped forward. Her lips tasted of sweet victory as she kissed him, and she didn't resist as he lifted her to perch on the edge of his desk. Luce's eyes didn't leave hers as he shrugged out of his jacket and folded it into a pillow. 
He tilted her back so that her head rested on his coat. He dropped to his knees. Please, Melody, he begged. Her knees, so modestly pressed together, parted slightly to reveal a glimpse of the soft white lace underwear that clung to her skin under her skirt. She sighed. All right, my love. 5. Luce felt her body shudder in pleasure. Her tiny gasp was all the sound she made. He was losing his touch, she didn't respond to him like other girls did. He'd done his best but he couldn't seem to coax the sort of climax out of her that made her scream his name. He sank to the floor, sitting back on his heels. I'm sorry Mel, he said quietly. He rose, placed her underwear on the desk beside her, and dragged himself to the private bathroom adjoining his office. He freshened up, taking unusual care washing his hands to delay the moment when he'd be forced to face her pity for his failure. Eventually, he returned to the office. Luce slumped in his desk chair, watching Mel smooth her skirt down as if she'd experienced no passion at all. She probably hadn't, he told himself. Mel leaned against the desk and folded her arms. What are you sorry for, Luce? I can't satisfy you properly. You barely made a sound. Other girls lose control and you, I couldn't. He closed his eyes, not wanting her to see his anguish. He was a failure, might as well be impotent if he couldn't satisfy her. She'd leave him and find some angel who could. Her gentle laughter only made him feel worse. Then her weight settled across his lap, her backside resting on his thighs as her legs pushed his arm off the armrest. You're sorry because I'm not like other girls? Girls you've corrupted in other words. Lou stared at her, his guilt rising. You want to know what I felt while you, why you? She blushed. Yes, he breathed. I want to know what I'm doing wrong so I can please you better. I need to know. Mel cupped his face between her hands and kissed him. The memory she gave him coalesced in his mind, intensifying as her kiss deepened. He felt every stroke of his tongue as though he controlled her body and not his own, on the receiving end of what felt like. Oh my god. Then he couldn't breathe. He couldn't see. He couldn't move and he was about to need clean underwear. Sensation ebbed before he exploded in his pants, but it had been damn close. He was shaking from the adrenaline and he wasn't sure he could speak yet. Mel kissed him again gently. You are the best I've ever had. I've told you this before. Here, feel my heartbeat, it's racing at just the memory. She slid Luce's hand under her shirt so that he could press his fingers to her breast, over her galloping pulse. Another kiss quickened the beat further. Luce grinned. His unoccupied hand crept toward her skirt in the hope that she'd let him monitor her heartbeat while he pleasured her one more time. Oh please. The office door flew open, framing Mephi in the doorway. Her jaw dropped, but her recovery was rapid. Mel? Oh, I told him he couldn't seduce the staff here. I'll call security and have them throw him out. Luce returned his wandering hand to the desk, hoping Mephi hadn't seen how close it had been to Mel's thigh. Mel gently broke their kiss and glanced at Mephi. No, security won't be necessary. Unless, well, in truth, I jumped loose, so he's the one who might want security to come and escort me out. He has his hand up your shirt, Mephi snapped, her eyes flashing red as she glared at Luce. Luce tried to shift his hand without Mephi noticing, but Mel placed her hand on her shirt, over her heart and Luce's hand, pressing his fingers against her soft flesh. Yes he does, Mel said smiling. But, she slid out of his lap and moved just out of reach. From what I understand of the situation here, there will be a lot of work for us to do and it's best that we get started as soon as possible. Later, Luce. She winked. Mephi's disapproving mouth twitched as if she wanted to smile, but she didn't. Luce had seen her smile before, but she didn't do it very often. Was she really so happy to see him back? Persephone must have made a pretty useless CEO if that was the case. He'd need Mel more than ever, thank God she was working for him and not Lily this time. 
Luce cleared his throat. Ah, Mephi, Mel will be taking on a special projects role for me here, and she'll need an office close to mine. Maybe the CFO office? It's not like we can trust any demon to do that job, so it's been empty since I fired Barakil. Mephi's frown deepened. Miss Angel's desk is still available. It might be best if she returned to it. She gave Mel a meaningful glance that made Luce's jaw drop. He picked it up quickly, hoping she hadn't noticed, as he turned over the possibility in his head, that Mephi liked Mel. Having to cross the whole office to that tiny cramped cubicle to find Mel? Hell no. Mel won't be doing her old job, and she'll need a bigger office. She'll also need a PA. Mephi, can you arrange it? I remember there used to be plenty of office girls running around the place. Surely you can spare one for Mel. I really don't need one loose, Mel objected. I've always handled my own schedule and calls. I'm sure anyone you assign to me will get bored with nothing to do. If the duties really are as light as you say, I'm sure I can take care of Miss Angel better than anyone else, Mr. Iblis. If that's acceptable to you, me, Miss Angel, Mephi corrected herself. Mel smiled. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Mephi. But you know you can call me Mel. Mephi nodded. Luce clapped his hands. That's settled then. Mephi, call IT and get them to set up the CFO office for Mel. Then alert all staff that they're required for a briefing in the lecture theater at 10. The moment the door clicked shut behind Mephi, Mel said, Before we were interrupted, I was going to say that if you like, the next time we make love, I'll show you how one of the Hashmelum can manage to withstand even your mind-blowing sex without being corrupted. Like he'd ever refuse her. You think I'm really that good? She laughed. Yes, my love. You're one sexy devil and you're better than good. 6. Once everyone's here, I'll brief them on the change of management and your role here then let you speak to them, Luce said as they entered the empty lecture theatre. Some idiot had stopped ordering coffee beans for the magnificent coffee machine Mel had won for them, so there was only that instant stuff that he wouldn't touch. He'd sent Mephi out for coffee for Mel and himself. Mel had laughed and said her first task would be to get the espresso flowing again, and he couldn't express his appreciation emphatically enough. Maybe after work. Mel laughed shakily. Me? Speak in front of everyone? Oh Luce, that's not a good idea. They all know you and they all owe you too. They'll shut up and listen to you, I swear. The gentle shake of her head brought him up short. What? Luce, I'm terrified of public speaking. You rescued me from it yourself once in this very room, when the fear overcame me and I fell to my knees. Your kindness that day always stands out in my mind. The room was full of human reporters, yet it was you, a demon who came to my aid and helped me up. She blushed. I thought then that you wanted something and you'd use my weakness against me, but you never did. How could he have forgotten? She'd fallen, and the only thought in his head was the irresistible urge to help her. The moment he touched her, he'd felt an alien ardor to hold her forever, and a powerful yearning for salvation only she could deliver. With his mind scrambling to understand the churning desires, he'd named her his savior in front of the assembled press. Luckily for him, they'd lapped it up. Or was it Mel's luck that had done it? I'll be there right beside you, he said. And it's not public speaking when you know them all and they know you. It's like a conversation with a lot of people all at the same time. Just say that the first thing you're going to do is sort out the coffee situation. Everyone will smile and clap. I'll warn them again not to ask you to unjam the photocopier or they'll be headed straight back to hell and we'll end the briefing. You're the most powerful angel any of them have ever seen capable of obliterating the lot of them if the mood takes you. You have nothing to be afraid of. It'll be fine. Her nervous smile tugged at his heart. All right, I'll try. 
Her pale purple skirt swirled around her legs as she crossed to a chair in the front row and gracefully lowered herself onto it. She made the warm cloth seat look like a throne, though it was no different to any of the others. Every movement she made screamed out that she was no ordinary angel. How could he have been so oblivious to it before? At ten, not a second before, demons started trooping in in groups of two or three. They filled up the middle and rear seats of the lecture theatre, row upon row of dark shirts and suits that made Mel and her pastels stand out all the more. There wasn't even a hint of red among them, Lily must still be in hell, loose-figured, which was fine by him. His chest still itched at the feel of her claws digging into his heart. He waited, letting them talk among themselves, until Mephi appeared in the doorway and gave a sharp nod. She perched on the edge of the seat nearest the door. Good morning, Luce began with a grin. As you can see, I'm back at the helm of the Hell Corporation, and the future's looking brighter than ever. Through my skills of persuasion, Miss Melody Angel has returned as special projects director and, with her assistance, business here in Hell will be better than ever. So I'd like everyone to warmly welcome back, Mel. Luce waved his arms with a flourish. Come up here where everyone can see you, Mel. She gave a painful smile and rose shakily to her feet. When the smattering of applause started, she stumbled but righted herself before she fell. Her gaze locked on Luce's and he couldn't help but see the determination that drove her to keep walking. Every step seemed to take more willpower than he'd ever owned. No. He'd promised to stand beside her and he would. Starting now. Luce strode to meet her, wrapping an arm securely around Mel's waist and walking with her the last few steps to the lectern. He was supporting most of her weight by the time he reached it, her legs seemed to want to fold up beneath her, but he couldn't let her fall. Couldn't let her show weakness in front of demons because they'd swarm like seagulls. They both turned to face the crowd and the clapping abruptly ceased. Mel's hand seized his and he was swamped by a flood of terror so intense he'd never experienced anything like it before. Not his, hers, as her throat froze so she could barely draw breath let alone speak. Not only did he have to keep her upright, he'd have to speak for his usually eloquent angel. Mel and I will be working very closely together for the foreseeable future, so I don't want to hear about anyone asking her to help them out on any project that hasn't been personally approved by me. If you need an appointment with Mel, Mephi will be handling her schedule. And if I hear anyone asking her to do anything with the photocopier, I will personally see that person transferred to level 8, effective immediately, Luce thundered. Mel, will you be the first point of contact for animal welfare and alien invasion issues? Someone called from the audience. Luce waited, but Mel still couldn't seem to loosen her tongue, so he answered, No, you'll refer those matters to whoever has been handling them since she left. Mephi will be screening all her calls, so if you try to call her for anything that I haven't approved. Let her speak for herself, someone shouted. Yeah, let her go. Before Luce could work out who had shouted, more than half the demons erupted out of their seats with similar angry shouts. It was like being back in his office in hell, where every demon had wanted to defend her and beg for her release. Instead of individual demands though, now there was a demonic cacophony that drowned out the whimpers he could feel escaping from Mel. Get out, he roared over them. This briefing is over. Get back to work. He repeated it several times until all the demons left the lecture theater. Mephi, who was the last, gave him a dark look as she descended the steps. Is Miss Angel all right? What can I do to assist? Mephi asked, sounding concerned even as her eyes burned red. She's fine, Luce said curtly. You get back to work too. He watched as she slowly made her way up the stairs and out the door. It wasn't until they were alone that he pulled Mel into his arms and whispered, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it would be this bad. Mel pushed herself far enough away to look up at him. The last time I managed to deliver a speech in front of a crowd, they turned into a mob and tore my body to pieces. 
Thousands of years may have passed, but I can still feel those clawing nails as if it was yesterday. I am a poor presenter at best, Luce. I'm sorry. It's hardly your fault. I won't make you do that again, ever. I swear. He wet his lips. How can I make it up to you? Mel smiled wanly. Maybe it'd be best if I went outside and got some fresh air for an hour or so before I return to work. I need to pick up a few things anyway. I'll return in time for lunch. Do you want me to come with you to make sure you're okay? I mean, you almost collapsed in here. She shook her head. I'll be all right. See you in an hour or so, my love. Don't burn the office down while I'm gone.